Why is there something rather than nothing? More often than not, this question is raised not because the person asking it actually has any interest in answering such a question, but rather as a rhetorical means of gesturing towards the notion that the cosmos might ultimately be too strange for human minds to truly comprehend that there are some questions which we might never be able to answer, no matter how many billions of dollars are spent in creating ever more sophisticated scientific instruments. Yet, as with many questions that seem utterly intractable, this question, why is there something rather than nothing, itself contains much more than might be readily apparent. So, first of all, what exactly is nothingness? Etymologically, we can see that nothing is somehow a no-thing. It is an absence of thingness, as it were. Things, in order to actually exist, must have some sort of structure. There must be the presence of form or patternicity which can allow things to be differentiated from other things and to allow for the continuation of such differentiation. Nothingness, therefore, could be understood as a lack of differentiation, a lack of pattern, structure, or form. When you imagine nothingness, you probably imagine something like a completely vacuous black void of sorts. Something like outer space, but with nothing present within that space. Yet even a void in its very emptiness is much more than we might realize. Emptiness is an absence, but absence itself is not only a lack but also potentiality. A blank canvas is not just a lack of a painting, because the blankness of the canvas contains within its emptiness the possibility of all possible paintings. In contrast, this painting of the birth of Venus already has achieved determinacy. Its form has been decided, and therefore it lacks all of the possibilities which remain within the blank canvas. Many artists of the mid-20th century, particularly abstract impressionists, experimented with absence of form, content, or both in their works by abstaining from elements which typically give shape to works of art, such artists were able to allow indeterminacy to remain within the works. In doing so, these artists thereby allowed the experience of their art to be determined much more so by the viewers of the art. The absence of form or content serves as a vacancy of meaning, which can be completed by the viewer of the art. What we see thus has much more to do with what we bring to the table than what the art might have been intended to convey. There is a sense then in which emptiness is actually more than somethingness, as the indeterminacy of nothingness is itself a kind of content. The less form something has, the more nothing nothing is, the more potentiality is therefore contained within it. Intuitively, it would seem that nothingness is the exact opposite of being. Yet, as Hegel shows us, if we examine being and nothingness in their essences, we find that the two are in fact strangely identical. What is the being of this particular painting? In searching for being, we might begin by stripping away all of the properties of the painting which are not the being of the painting. We imagine away the color, the texture, one aspect after another until finally we are left with 
nothing. The nothingness and being itself are both pure indeterminacy. To say that the existence of a thing consists in its participation within being is equivalent to saying that the existence of a thing consists in its participation in nothingness. The 13th century German theologian and mystic Meister Eckhart von Hockheim sought to understand what he referred to as the ground of existence. For Eckhart, the term ground indicates a kind of foundation as well as origin. Eckhart understood this ground to be the ultimate underlying essence of both God and reality itself. This groundless ground, or abgrund, is said in Eckhart's works to be a kind of absolute stillness, silence, and emptiness within which is contained all possibility, and the underlying essence of all existence. It is utterly imminent to all things at all times. It is the deepest aspect of our own existence and the existence of the cosmos as a whole, and therefore that which necessarily and intimately connects us to the cosmos and to all things within it. In a similar manner as the Hindu doctrine that Atman is Brahma, Eckhart tells us that the ground of the human soul the deepest and most essential aspect of our existence is also the ground of God's existence, and therefore that there is a fundamental co-participation between the human soul and God. Within Chinese Taoist cosmology, it is said that the source of the world is the Wuji, the term wuji means limitless and refers to the most fundamental and primordial state of the universe. The wuji is an absolute undifferentiation in which there is no polarity of yin and yang, this and that, being and nothingness. The wuji is said to have then divided itself, thus becoming the taiji the supreme ultimate, which consists of the polarity of primordial yin and primordial yang. In this cosmology, it would seem that a state of ultimate potentiality becomes two separate but interrelated modes of possibility. On the one hand, we have the yin mode of potentiality the no-thingness, emptiness, or stillness, which contains within it all possibility of becoming. On the other hand, we have the yang mode of potentiality, which consists in specific forms or patterns in themselves. Yang potentiality is thus much like the Platonic realm of the forms, the structures of pure potentiality or transcendental objects which can come to give shape to the world. The interplay of transcendental and imminent potentiality between light and darkness, being and nothingness, is what then gives rise to the world. It is not that there is something rather than nothing, but rather it is that something is what nothingness does. The primordial nothingness negates its own undifferentiation and thereby weaves reality into existence. During the late 18th century, the German philosopher, poet, and naturalist Johann von Goethe came to study the nature of color. Goethe was deeply unsatisfied with the Newtonian color theory, which was then dominant among scientists. Newton had concluded that color could be understood simply as distinct wavelengths of light, and therefore concluded that our experiences of color were essentially just markers or tags of a sort, which the mind used to differentiate these different wavelengths. Goethe saw this approach as an outgrowth of an untenable bifurcation of mind and matter. 
Goethe believed that our experience of the world is primary to our capacity to understand the world, and thus believed that scientific naturalism must be able to account for and integrate our actual experiences of the world. A true scientific naturalism, therefore, would need to be grounded phenomenologically, rather than grounded in an abstract and ultimately arbitrary splitting off of the world from our experiences. Goethe saw that a theory of color could serve as a paradigmatic model for such an approach. Through these efforts, Goethe came to see that colors were in fact the result of an interplay between light and darkness. Goethe took the color of the sun and sky to be the most basic instantiations of his color theory. The light of the sun passes through the atmosphere. It is thus a darkening of light, which then appears as yellow. The sky, conversely, is the darkness of space seen through the medium of light. It is a lightening of darkness which thus becomes blue. As the sun sets, its own light becomes further dampened by the atmosphere and thus becomes red. Across the horizon, we see the darkness of the sky become indigo and violet as we see it through an increasingly weak medium of light. This band of violet is called the Belt of Venus. As Goethe points out, this duality of yellow and blue is very much akin to the duality of major and minor chords, or key signatures, in music. I believe that this concept of color emerging from an interplay of light and darkness is something that we also find within the realm of fundamental archetypes. As we have already seen, light and darkness themselves seem to correspond to the two valences of primordial potentiality, which are said to underlie existence itself within many philosophical and mythological traditions. But light and darkness are not the only concepts which we find consistently throughout the philosophical, mystical, and mythological traditions of the world. Instead, we find an array of distinct forces of nature, personified as various gods and goddesses, heroes and monsters. Within all mythologies, we find narratives which depict the world as having been created by the interplay of such archetypal forces, the fundamental personalities or modes of nature which give rise to the world we inhabit. The studies of mythology, alchemy, and astrology were the means by which the ancients came to understand the relationships between these archetypal forces which continually play themselves out within human beings and within the world we inhabit. Plato referred to the planets as the visible gods. He saw the celestial bodies of the sky as physical instantiations of the archetypes which gave shape to the dynamics of nature. Now, of course, it is excruciatingly common for people in the modern world to be dismissive of astrology to the extent that the term has almost become synonymous with pseudoscience, especially among young men who believe that disengaged clinical rationality is the only mode of thought which can be taken seriously. I'm not going to be arguing for the empirical validity of astrology here, as that is itself a massive subject which extends far beyond the scope of this video. For my current purposes, what matters is that the basic archetypes of astrology are the basic building blocks of the ancient understanding of the world. If we want to truly understand ancient mythology or ancient esotericism, then we are obligated to first understand the basics of archetypal significations. Moreover, I think we can understand the astrological archetypes as emerging from the interplay of being and nothingness, or form and formlessness, in a manner that directly mirrors the way in which Goethe showed us that color emerges from the interplay of light and darkness. Moving forward, I will be articulating my understanding of the planetary archetypes. 
different researchers might differ in the specifics of what they see as the central denotations of these archetypes. And that is something worth keeping in mind. If this is something that you want to read more about, then there will be a link in the description to an introductory piece written by Richard Tarnas. Just as Goethe began with his examination of yellow and blue, here we will begin with an examination of the sun and the moon. The sun is the primary source of radiance within our world as well as the center of gravity, which incorporates the various celestial bodies of our solar system into a cohesive unity. Likewise, the solar principle within the human psyche is also a center of gravity. It is the center of personal identity, the sense of self. It is a will, and more specifically, it is a will to being which allows the psyche to shine forth and contribute its light unto the world. Within Christianity, the solar principle is embodied by the figure of Christ, who is understood to be the embodiment of the cosmic logos, the love of the world or will unto being, which creates and animates the world. The sun is also very closely related to the archetype of the hero, and the sun's rise, descent, and return reflects what the mythologist Joseph Campbell identified as the hero's journey, or the myth cycle, which we also see in the death and resurrection of Christ. Fundamentally, the solar principle is the principle of final teleology, and corresponds to the Jungian archetype of the self. The moon, conversely, is that which reflects the light of the sun and which casts such radiance into the darkness of the night, thereby illuminating the nocturnal realm. While solar thinking is an active seeking out, problem solving, or inquiring, lunar thought is contemplative and ruminating. Just as the moon casts light into the night, lunar consciousness reflects upon that which has already occurred. As the solar principle is a will which lures us forward into the future, the lunar principle is that which relates us to what we have inherited from the past. The moon is therefore associated with pregnancy, birth, and menstruation and associated with ancestors who dwell within the realm of the dead. If the sun is the principle of soul, then the moon is the principle of spirit. It is the manner by which the past continues into the present through its continual participation in the world. In Jungian terms, the moon corresponds to the archetype of the anima. Next we have Mercury a planet which is closest to the sun and which is the fastest moving, most rapidly changing planet within our solar system. Mercury is associated with writing, rational thinking, the exchange of ideas, conceptualization, and communication. Fundamentally, Mercury is the principle of ideation or noesis. The experiencing of ideas, forms, or concepts in themselves. The substance Mercury is highly reflective, just as mercurial thought reflects ideas. It is also liquid and malleable. It readily changes its form in the same way that the planet Mercury quickly moves about space, and the way that ideational thought can mold itself into different shapes. The ancients very much valued ideational thinking as they saw it as the means by which human beings could come to transcend the world of appearance and engage with the world of pure forms. Thus Mercury is associated with the legendary sage Hermes Trismegistus and the Egyptian god Thoth. Just as Mercury stands between the Sun and the rest of the solar system, mercurial thought is that which mediates between the human will and the forms which it apprehends in its valuing and decision-making. On our color wheel, I've placed Mercury in the color cyan, 
a lighter shade of blue which is closer to the realm of pure forms than the moon. If the moon is that which mediates between the solar will and the living past, then Mercury is that which mediates between the solar will and pure forms in themselves. Lunar thought is rumination, while mercurial thought is ideation. Blinking the sun, we then have Venus and Mars, planets which represent two primary modalities of the solar will. If the solar will is a will to being, then Venus is the will to being with, a will to symbiosis which drives us towards friendship, romance, sexuality, and artistic creativity. Venusian libido is the will to bring together the many such that they become one. It is the will of life forces to co-participate within one another. Venus is associated with artistic and aesthetic sensibilities. Beauty can be understood as the bringing together of multiplicities into complex, cohesive whole and the Venusian principle within us is that which is inexorably drawn towards such harmony. The Venusian spirit is a spirit of romanticism, but a spirit which can also manifest maladaptively as a spirit of pride and narcissism, thus the association with the figure of Lucifer. Within mythology, the Venusian principle is personified as Inanna, Ishtar, Asherah, the queens of heaven. Like Mercury, Venus is closer to the realm of pure form, as it is form which allows for multiplicities to be synthesized into harmonious unities. The color green is also particularly appropriate insofar as the Venusian will is that which gives rise to the fecundity of the springtime, as well as the vice of envy. Mars, conversely, is the masculine counterpole of Venus. Martian Andros is the will to achieve, to accomplish, and to overcome. It is the spirit of action, competitiveness, vigor, impulse, and aggression. The Martian will is the will towards specific goals and the determination and exertion required to achieve such goals. Mars is the yang to the Venusian yin. Like the planet itself, on our diagram, Mars will be red-orange, indicating its association with blood, fire, and iron. Being closer to the darkness of formlessness, Mars is a will which is thus more unrestrained and wild than that of the Sun or Venus. Jupiter was regarded by ancient cultures as the king of the gods, the sky father in contrast to the Venusian earth mother. Jupiter is the archetype of growth and expansion. Jovial feeling is a feeling of increasing power, of success and triumph. Kings are meant to be individuals who most embody the hierarchy of values which facilitate the vitality and perpetuation of a society or civilization. Within the ancient world, the archetype found at the apex of this hierarchy was Jupiter, as increases in strength, material wealth circles of social influence or even simply physical size like the planet Jupiter itself would naturally lead to one's ascension of the social hierarchies of ancient civilizations. Just as the Venusian personality strives towards achieving unity in a harmonic or symbiotic manner by synthesizing oneself with others, Jupiter instead strives towards incorporating the world into oneself. One's material possessions and social influences are extensions of the individual will, and therefore the Jovian drive towards such growth is a drive towards expanding one's will to encompass ever more aspects of the world one inhabits. 
The Jovian archetype is one of good fortune, success, and confidence, but also an archetype of opulence, hedonism, excess, and overextension. Mythologically, we find the Jovian archetype in figures such as Marduk, Zeus, Yahweh, Odin, and Perkunas. As Jupiter is associated with tin, Venus is associated with copper, due to being perceived as an aesthetically beautiful metal and because copper was once used in creating mirrors, connotating Venusian beauty and vanity. Merged with one another, Venusian copper and Jovian tin were used to create bronze, mirroring the intercourse of masculine and feminine principles in the creation of new life. As we now move closer to primordial light and darkness, form and formlessness, and into the domain of the outer planets, we enter into what I refer to as the Chthonic archetypes. Among these planetary bodies, the ancients knew only of Saturn, which, as we shall see, serves a kind of liminal or mediating role between the inner and outer archetypal domains. Although the ancients did not know of the planets which cannot be seen with the naked eye, the ancients did nonetheless make a fundamental distinction between the realms of the above and the below. The celestial realm of the heavens and firmament seen above and beyond the sky, which contrasted with the chthonic, subterranean realms of Hades and Sheol, the world of the past, the dead, chaos, and the darkness of the unconscious. In ancient Greece, Saturn was known as Kronos, the titan deity of time. Yet here we must understand time in a very specific manner. Saturn is associated with traditions, conservatism, and fate. It is a principle of constraint, contraction, limitation, the downward pull of gravity as well as the inward force of pressure. Saturn is associated with the element lead, indicating weight and rigidity. Fundamentally, Saturn is time in the sense of the inertia of the past. Like a boulder rolling down a hill, Saturnian time is the momentum of established institutions, norms, ideologies, or historical processes which weigh down the present, forcing the freedom of the present to conform to the demands of the past. Saturn is the hard, unyielding structure of the world as it has already come to be determined and defined. It is the reality of the world which our ideals, aspirations, and freedoms must account for and compromise with. Yet Saturn is also the wisdom and discipline which we inherit from the past, and thus Saturn corresponds with the Jungian archetype of the Senex, or wise old man. In polarity with the archetype of Saturnian time, we then have the archetype of Uranian time, and the first of the planetary bodies which lie beyond the reach of unaided human perception. In examining Uranus, we find ourselves now firmly within the chthonic, abyssal domain of the transcendental realm, the yin within the celestial yang. Uranus is associated with rebellion and liberation, with sudden, surprising, and sometimes violent ruptures of previous norms and institutions. Uranus is a force of creative inspiration and inventive genius. Like Saturn, Uranus is an archetype of time, but whereas Saturn is time in the sense of inertia, Uranus is instead time in the sense of tension and resolution dynamics. Uranus is the force which bursts through the cracks in the Saturnian dam. It is the fire which ignites the powder kegs within the holds of the Saturnian galleons. Mythologically, Uranus was the father of Saturn and was considered to be a god of the sky. 
more specifically, I think we can best understand Uranus as the god of the Empyrean, the fires which were believed to burn beyond the firmament and cast light through the stars, which were thought of as being like tiny pinpricks within the celestial veil. Uranus is the fire which Prometheus brought down to Earth and bestowed upon humanity, the power of the human psyche to break from the Saturnian order of nature and thus bend reality to our will. In Jungian terms, Uranus corresponds to the archetype of the trickster, who takes advantage of the contradictions hidden within existing orders so as to subvert them who exposes the flaws of established and rigidified norms and dogmas so as to force us to adapt and to evolve. Uranus is also heavily associated with electricity. Electrical discharge is a burst of energy which is a kind of rebalancing or correcting of a state of disequilibrium or tension a release of potential energy which can be harnessed to creative ends or which can be immensely destructive and deadly. Like Venus, Uranus is a force of creative power, but Uranus is much closer to the realm of pure form and the furthest away from Saturn. It is therefore the archetype which is potentially least constrained by the Saturnian reality principle. The planetary body of Uranus is also unique in that it is tilted 98 degrees, almost completely perpendicular to the average plane of rotation common to the other planetary bodies. The physical Uranus breaks from normalcy just as the Uranian personality does. Neptune is the oceanic archetype. It is the archetype of spiritual experiences, dreams, fantasies, illusions, and delusions. It is the archetype of transcendental experiences and transcendental aspirations, and is thus associated with the ocean, the signifier of all-encompassing idyllic oneness. Neptune's power is the unrestrained power of form and ideas to enchant and to encompass. Whereas mercurial thought is a kind of ideation which necessarily brings form into relation and contrast with the actual world, Neptunian thought engages with the ideal as something completely distinct from the actual. Neptune is therefore the force which brings our attention towards ideals which we might then aspire towards, but it also might draw us towards maladaptive escapism, narcissistic self-deception, and delusional detachment from the actual world. Like Uranus, Neptune is found directly adjacent to the Empyrean of pure form within our color wheel. Uranus is a kind of will which comes to instantiate form within actuality irrespective of what pre-existing structures might be destroyed in the process. Neptune is likewise irrespective of actuality, but in the sense that the Neptunian will is often unconcerned with whether or not its ideals can even be actualized at all. Neptune corresponds to the archetypal womb, the idealized primordial oneness which pre-exists the divisions which give rise to our sense of separate selfhood. Neptune is also often associated with addiction, which we can see as a manifestation of the Neptunian will to escape into a world of fantasy, or to create a kind of fog of insobriety between oneself and the world. Pluto, finally, is then the archetype of separation, and the primal anxieties which arise from our sense of being both within the world and separate from it. This sense of separation gives rise to what we could call a will to life, the drive to preserve and further oneself and thus maintain one's distinction from the world, as the breakdown of such distinction is death. 
the plutonic will is further away from the sun than Mars and closer to abyssal formlessness. The plutonic will is thus more primal, wild, and less restrained than that of Mars, the sun, or Venus. The plutonic instincts are the four Fs, fighting, fleeing, feeding, and the fourth thing. These are the basic biological drives which result from our sense of separation from the archetypal Neptunian womb. If the Neptunian impulse is a lure of return towards the primordial state of amniotic oneness, then the Plutonic impulses are, in a sense, the direct opposite. They are the instincts which compel us to maintain ourselves as separate from the world, the instincts which prevent our fragile boundaries from being destroyed, and our identities from then being resubmerged back into the endless flux of the world. The Plutonic can be intensely dark, paranoid, and violent, but the Plutonic is also a vitalizing, regenerative power which sustains us against the onslaughts of the world. Pluto signifies the vital, unconscious life forces which drive the savagery of the natural world. Within the Jungian framework, Pluto corresponds to the shadow. On our color wheel, Pluto is assigned to dark red, indicating its association with blood, violence, and primality. Like Neptune, Pluto is also associated with intoxicating substances, specifically with the unrestrained Dionysian primality which emerges as our Saturnian and solar restraints are loosened by intoxication. Oftentimes our will to intoxication is a chasing of Neptunian serenity, which then inadvertently results in the unleashing of our darker, plutonic instincts. Before moving on, I'd like to also briefly illustrate how we can also view the color wheel as modeling Joseph Campbell's myth cycle, or hero's journey. The myth cycle begins with Neptune, a state of idyllic, harmonious at-homeness. We then move down clockwise to Mercury, the phase in which the hero receives the call to adventure, a sort of message, which they might either reject or deny, but which they will ultimately be swept away by. We then continue on to the lunar phase, which serves as the first liminal threshold between the world of normalcy and the extraordinary nocturnal world within which the adventure will come to take place. In many cases, this phase takes place at night, thereby emphasizing the sense of transition or betweenness. Having fully entered the extraordinary or supernatural world, the hero then encounters trials or tests which they must overcome. Here we find the Jovian archetype as the hero encounters allies and adversaries which are more successful, experienced, competent, or powerful than the hero, and thus the hero must gain the skills, resources, or knowledge needed in order to navigate the trials to come. Next we have the guardian of the second threshold, represented by Saturn, who serves as the guardian of the boundary between the superordinary world and the abyss. Just as the Saturn archetype guards the threshold between the past and future, Having crossed the second threshold, the hero must then encounter ultimate darkness, here represented by Pluto. Here the hero encounters the true unknown, that which even his prior trials could not prepare him for. This is the stage in which the hero comes to learn secrets which previously had remained hidden, dark and dangerous revelations which change the nature of the demands which the journey will make of the hero. This phase is sometimes referred to as the belly of the beast. Next we move on to the Martian phase, in which the hero manages to escape the abyssal realm, either by his own strength and determination, or by that of his allies. 
Next, we enter the solar phase, in which the hero must undergo some sort of atonement, transformation, resurrection, or sacrifice in order to prepare himself for the coming climax. Following this transformation, the hero then enters the Venus phase, the meeting with the goddess, in which the hero comes to integrate or reintegrate powers which he was previously unable to possess. The hero encounters some aspect of himself which he was previously estranged or alienated from, and is now able to synthesize those disparate elements together into a unity which is now capable of engaging in the final confrontation. Finally, we have the Uranus phase, the climactic battle in which the ideal and the actual come into explosive conflict with one another. Barriers are broken down, the hero is pushed to his absolute limits, but finally we see that the transformations endured by the hero throughout the journey were just sufficient to allow for victory. Having resolved the underlying conflicts, at least temporarily, the story ends with a return to the state of idyllic Neptunian oneness, which the story began with. The narrative ends as it began, but with the hero now having been transformed by the process. This color wheel is just one of many ways in which one might express the relationships between these fundamental archetypes. Within the sky itself, the planetary representatives of these archetypes are arranged in a different manner, but one which is equally rich in symbolic significance. But now I want to bring our attention instead to another kind of archetypal diagram, the Tree of Life. The Tree of Life is a diagram which originates in Kabbalah, a mystical tradition which began with Judaism, but which was later adapted and integrated within both Christian and polytheistic forms of Western esotericism. The Tree of Life is comprised of either 10 or 11 spheres, depending on how the diagram is depicted and the framework which it is being used within. These spheres are known as Sephirot, which are understood to be the divine emanations which issue forth from the Ein Sof, a word which, much like the Wuji of Taoist cosmology, means limitless or boundless. The Lamites, Kabbalists, and other esoteric practitioners have devised a number of different ways to bring the Sephirot of the Tree of Life into correspondence with the planetary archetypes. For now, however, I'm not going to focus much attention on the specific relationships between the Sephirot and the planets per se, as that would require delving into the specific significations of all 11 Sephirot, a task which is beyond the scope of my present purposes. Also, to be honest, all of the other diagrams I found online which map the planetary archetypes onto the Tree of Life strike me as just very incorrect, so make of that what you will, I guess. For now, what I would like to do instead is to illustrate how we can reveal new patterns by arranging the planetary archetypes in accordance with the Tree of Life diagram. The Tree of Life is understood to be both a downward pathway of emanation as well as an upward pathway of transcendence concepts which we also find in Neoplatonist philosophers such as Plotinus. As such, I think we can begin by placing the Earth itself at the bottom of the tree, corresponding to the Sephira Malkut, or Kingdom. At the top, conversely, we will identify the Sephira Keter with the planet Neptune, as Neptune signifies an idyllic and expansive oneness. As Keter is the Sephira, which is only one step removed from the limitless light of Ein Sof, this seems like a natural designation. For the Sun and the Moon, then, I'm going to place these in a way that follows what most others have done. The Moon corresponding to Yasad, which mediates between the Earth and the Transcendental Realm, and the Sun corresponding to Tiferet, which serves as a center of gravity within the Tree of Life. 
In Kabbalah, Tiferet is said to be an archetype of beauty, which allows for the integration and balancing of the other Sephiroth, thus mirroring the role of the sun in astrology. Moving forward, I'm going to place the remaining inner planets around the sun, with Mars, Venus, Jupiter, and Mercury, corresponding to the Sephiroth Gevura, Chesed, Netzah, and Had. It is here that we see a pattern which seems to me to correspond to ideas developed by the Jungian psychologist Robert Moore. In his work, Moore developed a system of five archetypes, which he often conceptualized as a four-sided pyramid. Each of the four faces correspond to one of four primary archetypes, the warrior, the lover, the king, and the magician. At the apex of the pyramid is the higher self, the ideal of self-cohesion in which the other archetypal valences of the personality are integrated with one another. Within our planetary tree of life, this higher self corresponds to the sun and the Sephirah Tiferet. Radiating outward from the sun, we then have Mars, the warrior, Venus, the lover, Jupiter, the king or queen, and Mercury, the magician. Next, we can place the remaining outer planets. With Neptune already at the apex, I'm next going to place Pluto, Saturn, and Uranus in correspondence with Chokma, Bina, and Da'at, respectively. In doing so, we see the emergence of another archetypal configuration, what the Zhek psychiatrist Stanislav Grof has termed the perinatal matrices. In his experimental and clinical research, Grof came to conclude that within the depths of the human psyche, we find a sort of core trauma complex, a birth trauma, which is shaped by the harrowing ordeal of one's physical birth. In exploring this phenomenon, Groff came to conclude that birth trauma could be best understood as having a fourfold structure consisting of four distinct matrices, which correspond to different stages of the birth process. Through case study explorations of birth trauma, through altered states of consciousness, Groff came to detail the significations of these four matrices, with each matrix being associated with specific forms of symbolic imagery and psychological states. Many years later, Groff's colleague Richard Tarnas, an esteemed historian of science and philosophy, came to see that Groff's perinatal matrices corresponded very precisely to the archetypal significations of the outer planets, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. As Groff himself states, quote, one particularly notable observation was Tarnus's realization that my description of the experiential patterns associated with the stages of biological birth showed astonishing similarity to the four archetypes that astrologers have empirically correlated with the four outer planets of the solar system. My description of the phenomenology of four basic perinatal matrices pertaining to different stages of the birth process was based on clinical observations made quite independently many years before I knew anything about astrology, end quote. The first perinatal matrix corresponds to the state of undifferentiated uterine oneness, the state of identity between mother and child, which precedes the initiation of the birthing process. As Groff describes this stage, quote, while experiencing the episodes of undisturbed embryonal existence, the first perinatal matrix, we often encounter images of vast regions with no boundaries or limits. Sometimes we identify with galaxies, interstellar space, or the entire cosmos. Other times we have the experience of floating in the ocean or of becoming various aquatic animals such as fish, dolphins, or whales. The undisturbed intrauterine experience can also open into visions of nature, 
safe, beautiful, and unconditionally nourishing like a good womb, Mother Nature." End quote. As indicated by such idyllic Arcadian and oceanic imagery, Tarnas and Groff came to associate the first perinatal matrix with the planet Neptune, which we have placed at the apex of our Tree of Life diagram and the starting point of the color wheel hero's journey described previously. Those of you who are familiar with my series on John Gebser's magnum opus, The Ever-Present Origin, might also notice that this phase also seems to coincide with Gebser's description of the archaic structure of consciousness. Gebser describes archaic consciousness as being a state of undifferentiated oneness, which historically preceded our sense of separation from nature. Gebser also describes the archaic structure through alluding to idyllic archetypal imagery, specifically the Garden of Eden. The second perinatal matrix is characterized by contraction. It is the beginnings of the sense of separation between mother and child. It is associated with feelings of nihilism and pessimism, the sense that the world is an uncaring other which wishes to crush or devour the individual. As Groff states, quote, It is associated with skepticism and a profoundly pessimistic view of existence, a shattering crisis of meaning the inability to enjoy anything and loss of any connection with the divine dimension of reality. In astrology, all these qualities have long been regarded as attributes of the more challenging side of the Saturn archetype." End quote. It is at this stage that the survival of the mother requires the expulsion of the child. The will to survive of the mother's body begins to act upon the child as something other, something separate from itself. The ontological inertia of the mother's body thus comes into conflict with the child's at-homeness within the womb, and thereby initiates a life-and-death struggle with the newly emerging will to life of the child, which is expressed within the next perinatal matrix. Perinatal matrix 3 is this life-and-death struggle in which the child finds itself forced for the first time to struggle for its own survival and therefore required to experience itself as something which must be preserved in distinction from the womb which it had previously felt itself to be a part of. As Groff states, quote, this matrix represents an unusual combination of themes characteristic of the final stage of biological birth, including the unrelenting thrust of an elemental driving force, the unleashing of titanic energies, Dionysian agony and ecstasy, birth, sex, death, rebirth, elimination and scatology, motifs of volcanic eruptions, pyrocatharsis, purifying fires, and the underworld, urban, criminal, psychological, sexual, and mythological. Astrologically, all these are regarded as attributes of Pluto, the archetype of primordial energy." End quote. Together, the second and third perinatal matrices corresponding to the archetypes of Saturn and Pluto respectively, seem to correspond to what Jean Gebser refers to in the ever-present origin as the magical structure of consciousness. It is the structure of consciousness associated with our original sense of being separate from, yet inexorably within and of, the natural world which we came to emerge from. It is a structure of primeval imagery, of blood, birth, death, predation, and primal anxieties, within which the world is experienced in a fundamentally auditory manner. Synchronicity, resonance, vibration, rhythm, 
this auditory character seems to mirror the state of the second and third perinatal matrices in which the child remains enveloped by the darkness of the mother's womb. Finally, we have the fourth perinatal matrix, the moment of birth itself, the moment of release in which the child is finally liberated from the womb and introduced to the world as the first breaths are drawn. Broff explains, quote, The fourth perinatal matrix represents the final stage of delivery, where the discomfort and pressure culminate and are resolved in an explosive liberation. It is characterized by such features as the unexpected resolution of a difficult situation, breaking through and transcending boundaries, brilliantly illuminating insights, Promethean liberation and epiphany, sudden rising to a new level of awareness and consciousness, and radical freedom from previous constrictions. All these themes are associated by astrologers with the planet Uranus." End quote. The planet Uranus and the fourth perinatal matrix represent a sudden radical metamorphosis. Looking once more to the ever-present origin, it seems to me this phase would correspond to a transitional phase between the magical and mythical structures, one which we might regard as corresponding to the early Neolithic period of human history, in which humanity began to create permanent settlements which created a boundary between the world of human life and the world of Mother Nature. Just as Saturn represents the threshold between the superordinary realm and the abyss within the hero's journey, and the boundary between the visible and invisible planets within our solar system, likewise we see here Uranus signifying a boundary between two distinct modes of human consciousness. On one side of this boundary, we have archaic and magical consciousness, phases in which human consciousness is felt to be fundamentally connected with the Great Mother Goddess, as well as the first three perinatal matrices, in which the human child remains within the mother's womb. Pre-Oranian consciousness is a mode of spiritual awareness which remains connected to the earth beneath us, to the chthonic realm of dark, primal, animistic, and biological vitality. On the other side of this boundary, we have the mythical consciousness structure, in which human awareness turns upwards towards the sky, the sun, and the visible planets. Within our Tree of Life diagram, this brings us back down to the great pyramidal structure of the warrior, the lover, the king, and the magician the primary archetypes of the mythical structure and the classical age, the adolescence of human consciousness. Human spirituality would then turn towards the luminary archetypes, the sun and moon, as lights to guide the integration of the developing sense of human selfhood. Taoism, for example, would achieve a form of spirituality which is predominantly lunar in nature, oriented towards ancestry and the natural processes which we inherit from the past. Christianity, conversely, would be a predominantly solar form of spirituality, in which salvation would be achieved through bringing the individual will, that is, the individual solar principle, into accordance with the divine logos, the cosmic solar principle, or Christ. Moving down to the last rung of our tree of life, we find ourselves within the sphere of the earth in which human consciousness comes to be oriented almost exclusively towards physicality, material power, and technological manipulation of the world. This phase is then the state of utmost separation and alienation from the world, an epoch of nihilism, pessimism, and narcissism, which can only be overcome through ascension and the reintegration of the higher aspects of reality. The reintegration of the inner aspects of our own reality, which we have lost sight of. 
The big picture here, which hopefully I've been able to communicate clearly in this video, is that archetypes are not simply motifs which we find to be recurrent throughout human cultural traditions, nor are archetypes simply psychological projections, idiosyncratic aspects of the human psyche which condition the way that we experience and think about the world. Rather, archetypes must be understood as the basic modalities, phases, motifs, and personalities which characterize the workings of reality itself, the most fundamental structural elements or colors of the complex processes which are the living world. By bringing our attention to the color wheel of archetypes, the hero's journey, and the tree of life, I've hoped to illustrate the fact that there is indeed a geometry to such archetypes, a geometry of meaningful relationships which the ancients seem to have understood far more clearly than we do now in the modern world. Nonetheless, these patterns remain for us to discover if we know how to look into the world and into ourselves.